Hello, my name is Jose Perucho, and today I'd like to talk about the intravoxel incoherent motion MRI assessment of chemoradiation-induced pelvic bone marrow changes in cervical cancer and its correlation with hematological toxicity. First, a quick introduction. Whole pelvis combined chemoradiotherapy, henceforth CRT, is the standard treatment for locally advanced cervical cancer and is effective in improving overall survival and reducing local recurrences. However, RT that treats a large volume of the pelvic bone marrow is known to induce hematological toxicity in patients. This is particularly problematic as the pelvic bone marrow is the primary site of hematopoiesis due to its red marrow content and radiation-induced damage leads to eventual fatty replacement of the irradiated marrow. The cortex is an important structure in housing the bone marrow. It is composed of the cellular stroma, which itself contains stem cells and is sensitive to radiation, and sinusoids. When subjected to radiotherapy, the cellular stroma faces perturbed hematopoiesis since the pelvic bone marrow is filled with hematopoietic red marrow. Likewise, when the sinusoids are subjected to RT, it results in perturbed microcirculatory dynamics, leading to a local breakdown and anthropopoenic hemorrhaging. Previous studies seeking to image radiation-induced complications used dynamic contrast MRI, whose metrics were signal intensity and contrast enhancement to look at the perfusion-related effects and changes following RT in the sinusoids. Diffusion-weighted imaging, whose chief metric is apparent diffusion coefficient, looked at the diffusion-related effects and changes following RT in the cellular stroma. Intervoxel incoherent motion was previously proposed to acquire diffusion and perfusion-related effects in a single acquisition sequence. The method comes from the observation that, at low P values, the diffusion decay curve does not follow a linear decay, as is the assumption in calculating ADC. The resulting bi-exponential model was thought to be a result of perfusion-related effects only observable at these low B values, and become negligible in higher B values. Thus, IVIM produces three metrics, pure diffusion coefficient D, perfusion fraction F, and the pseudo-diffusion coefficient D star, though D star is not often included in analysis due to low SNR. We theorized that IVIM would allow us to simultaneously assess radiation-induced changes in the cellular stroma and sinusoids. Moving on to the materials and methods. So the treatment schedule was as follows. Locally advanced cervical cancer patients had an initial clinical diagnosis, after which they received additional radiological diagnosis. This is where we acquired diffusion-weighted imaging and its IVIM counterpart. Baseline bloods were also taken for toxicity response later. Patients were then sent for their four-week concurrent chemoradiotherapy, after which a second MRI scan was taken for post-treatment response. Post-treatment bloods were also taken to evaluate for toxicity response. Here we dichotomized patients based on their hematological toxicity, HT for short. So we split into two groups, patients suffering HT versus those who did not suffer HT. When analyzing baseline and post-treatment images, two observers each placed two sets of equally sized regions of interest along the acetabulum and the ilium. The first set of ROIs had an area of 100 mm squared, while the second had an area of 300 mm squared, leaving us with four sets of ROIs. Thus, in addition to evaluating for hematological toxicity, we were also able to evaluate the reliability of our measurements. First was inter-observer variability, where we looked at the difference between observer 1 and observer 2, and also the size dependency of ROIs to see if there was a significant difference in measurements between the 100 mm squared area ROIs and the 300 mm squared ROI areas. For statistical analysis, we split this into two parts. The first part dealt with the evaluating of radiation-induced changes in DWI and IVIM metrics. We used the Mann-Whitney U-test and subgroup analysis to see if there were any significant differences in the changes in ADC, D, and F between HT and non-HT patients. The second part dealt with the reliability of measurements, where we used bland altman analysis, which is a method of assessing variance between measurements. Here we looked at the previously mentioned inter-observer variability and ROI size dependence, and its effects on our DWI and IVIM measurements. And for the results of our study, there were 39 patients in the study, with a median age of 54 and a range of 27 to 83 years old. Of the 39 patients, 14 suffered HT, and the remaining 25 did not. For FIGO staging, 8 were of stage 1b2, and the remaining 31 were of stage 2 to 4a. As for histology, 28 patients had squamous cell carcinoma, 10 patients had adenocarcinoma, and 1 had clear cell carcinoma. For subgroup analysis, the figure shows box plots of delta D on the left, 
Delta ADC in the middle, and Delta F on the right, where blue boxes were non-HT patients and pink boxes were HT patients. We noted that only Delta D was significantly different between both groups. We also found that in HT patients, Delta D had an increasing trend, while in non-HT patients, Delta D had a decreasing trend. The significant difference observed in Delta D between HT and non-HT patients can be qualitatively observed in imaging. These four images are of V parametric maps where the top row is from an HT patient and the bottom row is from a non-HT patient. The left column is from the baseline MRI and the second is from post-treatment MRI. Note that in the HT patient there is marked increase in signal intensity in the ilium, a feature not reflected in the non-HT patient. When we looked at measurement variance using blind Altman analysis, we used the clinically acceptable variation threshold of less than 10%. We found that inter-observer variability and ROI size dependence in all images was within clinically acceptable variability. And that brings us to the discussion. Our study found that Delta D, IVIM's perfusion-free diffusion, was higher in patients suffering HT. This suggests that the radiation-induced alteration in the pathophysiology includes cell wall damage, necrosis, hemorrhaging, and inflammation. This suggests a timeline of cell death of stem and hematopoietic cells, leading to an expansion of extracellular matrix, ultimately resulting in 1. delayed bone marrow regeneration, and 2. increased fat marrow composition. The lack of trends in delta F may suggest that the microcirculatory changes in the pelvic bone marrow following CRT may be delayed. This would necessitate more imaging time points to fully evaluate. Whereas the reason for the lack of trends in delta ADC is unknown. However, this might be due to the small sample size of the study. In conclusion, our study found that delta D was able to detect temporal microenvironment changes in the pelvic bone marrow microenvironment following CRT. Also, Delta D was able to differentiate patients with HT and non-HT. And I'd like to end with the following acknowledgement and our funding source. And lastly, thank you for your kind attention.